Creating a decluttered home can seem completely overwhelming, but there are a few things that can make it a million times easier. Now, if you've been trying for a while and you keep coming up against roadblocks, you might be falling into this trap. Now, if we've never met before, my name is Robin. I'm a registered nurse, mom and wife, and I am a recovering clutterer. One thing I've learned is that a mindset shift needs to happen and maybe the stuff isn't the problem. There is one intense reason why I was stuck decluttering and it probably is why you get stuck too. And it's also the same reason why only 9% of people actually stick to their New Year's resolutions. It's called the comfort zone, but don't worry, we're gonna tackle that. But first, I wanna look at a little baby bird in a nest. I mean, it is so comfortable in there. It is cozy, mama's there. There are feathers to keep you all snug and warm. Now, sure, you are a growing bird and you might want to stretch your wings and consider learning to fly, but that's a little bit scary, so you back it off. So what feelings come up for little bird when she is thinking about leaving the nest and flying? Well, number one, She's excited. She's like, I'm gonna go and fly. That sounds pretty fun. But the other one is fear. I mean, change is scary. I certainly didn't realize it when I started decluttering, but that is a pretty big change too. You're kind of changing a little bit about your identity, which can feel very threatening. So in addition to excitement and fear, I also felt dread and overwhelm. And I invite you to explore what feelings and beliefs come up when you think about decluttering or making a big change. Maybe write it down, grab a pen and paper. So think about that little baby bird. I mean, she could fall. It's a scary world out there for a baby bird. And she also doesn't know how to fly. She also might make a mistake. She isn't a strong bird yet. So what are the reasons that those feelings and beliefs come up for little bird? And what are the benefits to staying in her comfortable little nest? Well, the nest is warm. Food is brought right to little bird. And I ask you, list the benefits for you to avoid decluttering and staying stuck. Maybe it's not dealing with those provoking feelings. For example, Time passing, which by the way, is my least favorite topic, yet unavoidable. Maybe it's that if you stay stuck, you don't have to make those tough decisions because there are a lot of decisions when you're decluttering. Still worth it though. Or you get to stay comfortable and safe in your home without making any changes because change is scary. Maybe you don't like the idea of having to focus on yourself and your environment or even simply, you just don't know how. So Baby Bird wants to fly, but she has to learn how to fly. And she has to be vulnerable and to focus on her own growth in order to do that. Does that at all sound familiar to you? Does it, is it just me? It's, it's just me, isn't it? Okay. There are some consequences to not making that change though. Baby Bird will miss out on so much if she stays in that nest forever. She will miss out on exploring finding worms and flying. I mean, can you think of anything more free than flying? She will miss out on freedom. Is that not majorly tragic to you? That's majorly tragic to me. Now, what are some painful consequences to not decluttering? Well, I would think number one, you might say it's stress. You write this down for yourself though. Maybe it's stress of living in a cluttered environment, which for most people, not all, but most is stressful. Or maybe it's still having to manage all of that clutter because goodness knows clutter takes some management. The other thing is your family will continue to live with clutter, which is certainly a painful consequence or that you continue to live with clutter, which I would say is an even more painful consequence. Another one is that your life is passing you by because you are just wearing clutter goggles and it just is distracting and takes a little bit of the joy away from life. You're not prioritizing yourself by ignoring your all important environment. I think Baby Bird needs to spend some time with her negative emotions and beliefs. Now, believe me, believe me, this is my least favorite thing to do. And I'm sure it's Baby Bird's favorite, least favorite thing to do. But she's gonna spend some time thinking, she's gonna talk to some friends, and she is gonna write 
so she can process things in her little bird brain. And I'm just gonna say, like, you probably should process your negative beliefs. And yes, this might take a while, and maybe you need to seek some professional help. And that is not only great, it's admirable, so good for you. So what is wrong with those beliefs we talked about before? Well, baby bird, she realizes she was meant to fly. She's a bird, after all. She also knows change is hard, but that's how she can grow. And a warm nest is actually not where she is meant to spend all of her time. And for you, maybe you believe that decluttering is bad. Maybe you think it's wasteful. I invite you to ask yourself where that belief actually came from. Or maybe you believe that you don't know where to start. Why do you think that that is? I also want you to ask yourself, what will life look like in another year of living with clutter? In five years of still living with clutter? Or in 10 years, if you just don't take control of your all important environment? Now, baby bird realizes she actually wants to fly. She wants to explore. She wants to catch her own worms. So what beliefs would she have to adopt to make that change happen? Well, number one, change is worth it. Yes, change can be a little bit hard, but the change is worth it. Yes, exploring is fun. Growth is worth it. When we do hard things, we grow as a person and a bird, and that's awesome. And freedom is amazing. Now, I will ask you this question. What beliefs could you adopt to fill the void of those old beliefs? Baby bird says, I'm meant to fly. I want to fly and I believe in freedom. What are your beliefs? And what will your amazing future look like? Now, did you know that clutter is actually more than just annoying, but it actually can be super hazardous to your health? This is no joke, check out this. Clutter is defined as an overabundance of material possessions that collectively create disorderly and chaotic home environments. Basically, all of your clutter makes it messy, which makes your home feel chaotic. And all of that mess actually makes it hard for us to live our normal activities, such as cooking, cleaning, moving safely around our home, enjoying being in our home. If we haven't met before, my name is Robin. I'm a registered nurse. I am also a life and focus coach and a minimalism YouTube creator because I have seen the light and I love a reasonably minimalist home. You don't have to go minimalist, but I do suggest you do some decluttering. And let's get into why. So first, why is clutter so bad for us? What happens when we start adding more and more things to our life, more things to our home? Well, imagine that this life is your life, your window, your window to your life. And you can look out and you can be like, oh, I love it. I love my life. Look at all those things. As we start piling clutter, something starts to happen. It starts building up. Kind of hard to see out. Kind of hard to see my life right now. I can't really see my family as well. I can't feel the emotions I wanna feel. I can't see as much. I can't absorb it. I can't enjoy it as much. That is how I feel. It is like living with all of this clutter in your life. You have piled things that are distracting you hugely. And why is clutter so distracting? One study showed that pilots were affected by too much visual stimuli. And that's what happens to us in our home. We are completely overstimulated. Have you ever gone to a hotel room and just been like, I like it in here. I can relax in here. There's less visual distraction. And the visual distraction of clutter increases cognitive overload and can reduce our working memory. Meaning we forget what we're doing while we're doing it or we are way slower. Which means way more times walking into rooms saying, why did I come in here? The thing is, sometimes you may have started decluttering and you found it really hard. The thing about clutter is it actually is holding you down. It's actually paralyzing you. As you add more and more and more things on, it gets harder and harder to even tackle it. And the stimulus from clutter not only makes it harder to live our life, but also that stimulation makes it hard to be motivated, meaning all of that multiple stimuli in your house, all of that stuff competes for your brain's attention, which overwhelms your brain, making it hard to do anything, including declutter. So really the cycle is just making things worse. Now I used to work in the emergency department and I would leave at the end of a very long day 
after dealing with people who had had the hardest day of their life. It was sad. Sometimes it was the last day of people's life. And I would get home to a cluttered house, a messy cluttered house. And it was so stressful, I can't even tell you. And so instead of sitting down, snuggling my family and just sort of talking about the day, debriefing, no, instead I would start cleaning. I would have to start decluttering. I would have to start trying to deal with the piles, but I couldn't deal with the piles because there was just so much. So I would end up feeling defeated and grumpy. My husband was grumpy and we would argue. The kids weren't happy. It was a whole big thing. Not to mention that the clutter puts you at way higher risk of accidents, of tripping and falling, and all of these awful things happening to you. Asthma from dust, all of that. But clutter increases stress because it increases our stress hormone of cortisol. And the thing about cortisol is that everyone's cortisol, it rises and falls each day. We wake up in the morning, our cortisol levels go up. It's kind of just like what helps us get going in the morning. But it should go down somewhat rather quickly after we start the day. Now there was a study where women were touring around their cluttered homes. Their blood work showed higher cortisol levels throughout the day, somewhat consistent without the steep slopes of relief, which basically shows that they had like a chronic stress, potentially from the clutter in their home. And all of the studies that I reference in this video, I will have linked below. There is also a correlation between depressed mood, anxiety, and neuroticism. Researcher Libby Sander argued that our physical environments significantly influence our cognition emotions and behaviors, including our relationships with others. So let's break that down for a quick second here. Cognition. So basically like how we think, meaning we will think slower. We kind of got into that before. Emotions. It can make us grumpy. It can make us cranky. It can make us feel more anxious and it influences our behaviors, how we're talking to others, whether or not we're exercising, even what foods we're eating. These are big things and our relationships with others. So anybody who's ever lived with a spouse or a partner knows we can get on each other's nerves. Well, clutter makes that way harder to deal with. And all of this stress impacts everyone in the household, including children. Now the blood work inflammation marker, C-reactive protein done on children showed an increased level if they were living in a cluttered environment and that basically shows that that was from stress. Now, another study showed that a tense or nervous mother, in addition to a cluttered environment, could result in that mother being more authoritarian in her parenting. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't address hoarding disorder. Excessive clutter is a sign of compulsive hoarding, which is remarkably common with one study showing 2.5% of people actually having this disorder. Now, just because you have clutter doesn't mean you do have hoarding disorder. I want to point that out. People with this disorder though are more likely to have psychological comorbidities, including OCD, inattentive ADHD, anxiety, and major depressive disorder. And we have ADHD in my family, so. You might wonder what chronic stress actually does to the body. Cortisol, when it is chronically elevated, can impact your immune system. Have you ever been really stressed for a period of time, maybe a week or two, and then you got a cold or something? That could be the result of cortisol. It also makes it hard for us to fight normal viruses, and your immune system is what helps you tackle things like cancer. Elevated cortisol can also impact your cardiovascular system, increasing your risk of stroke and heart attack. So you're probably like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. This is doom and gloom. I don't know, what am I gonna do? Here's the thing. First and foremost, you should always keep your primary care physician or your nurse practitioner in the loop. There is no shame in any of these disorders or health conditions, but you have the opportunity to change your life no matter what stage you're at. Improving your environment will make it more enjoyable to live your life, probably improve your health. So I suggest if you haven't already, make an appointment with your doc or your nurse practitioner and let them know what's going on. The other thing is therapy, psychologists can be hugely helpful. Talking these things out, exploring maybe where the, what the root cause of this is. Even if you have the other comorbidities we talked about, there still can be things that impact us, maybe from childhood, perhaps you had a parent or grandparent who grew up during the depression and they really were not a fan of decluttering things, or you grew up in a messy environment or a super sterile environment. 
It could be many things. Those are just a few examples. And how do you start decluttering? Well, you can make a huge difference in your life and your family's life today by starting small. In 2011, neuroscience researchers using fMRI and other measurements found that clearing the clutter from your home and your work environment could actually improve your focus. And I bet that really improved your overall well-being as well. James Clear says, by changing your surroundings, you can place a hurdle in the way of bad behaviors and remove the barriers to good ones, which I love. I like to refer to the strategy as environmental design. And I love this because this is like, if you clean your environment, if you get it decluttered, if you have it set up so everything has a place and a place for everything, that you will actually have a tidier environment which makes doing everything in life easier. It makes making cupcakes easier. It makes playing with your kids easier. It makes playing with your grandkids easier. It just makes everything easier. I always suggest starting small. Start with just one drawer, one small place. I like to suggest people start with the junk drawer because that is usually a pretty quick win. Ask yourself these questions. Does this serve me? Do I use this? Does this add value to my life? And would I buy this again? Because if the answer is no, then you probably could let it go. And as you go through that process more and more, which makes it easier to tackle your house. Another thing you should do is write down why you want to declutter. Maybe you're going to say, for my health, for my mental health, because it'll make me feel better for a number of reasons. Write that down put it in a prominent spot, and then just chip away at it every day. Now, which systems have you tried in the past to declutter? I have ranked five, so check out this part, comment below, let me know which one you hate, which one you've tried, and which one you love. So maybe your home has a little bit of clutter, or maybe you wanna get a whole lot of it out of there, and maybe you don't know where to start. So I'm gonna tell you five popular methods you can use to declutter, and you can decide which one works for you. Grab your tea, and let's go. The first one I want to talk to you about is the one room a week method. Now this method involves decluttering one room each week until your whole home is organized. And it can be super helpful to break the task down into smaller, more manageable steps, which is why it's good to do one room a week. However, this method has some pros and cons. Now, I think this would be absolutely perfect for somebody who wants to do a light declutter. Maybe you've actually already done the bulk of your decluttering. You've gone in there and you've made all the tough decisions, the tears, the laughter, all of it but you're doing another pass, the onion method, as Dawn, the minimal mom says. And I think that the one room a week method would be so good for those people. Now, I don't think that this is a great method for somebody who has a moderate to large amount of things to declutter. So a week is way too much pressure. And I think a lot of people might say, okay, I'm going to declutter my whole kitchen over a week, but then all of a sudden the kids need something or your husband needs something or your mom's in the hospital, whatever. Then you get completely overwhelmed because you didn't get it done in a week and we quit. It's that perfectionism again. And for that reason, the one room a week method gets number five, the KonMari method. This is a very good method popularized by Marie Kondo. We sort items by category and only keep things that spark joy. One thing you need to know though, is that part of this process involves getting all of something out, like all of your clothes and deciding what you're going to do with every single thing. So when you start, you're committed. It would be like literally getting everything out in your kitchen and doing that. You could do a smaller method, like maybe just all of the storage containers or something like that. And I really like the KonMari method in a lot of ways. There are a lot of times though when spark joy is useful, but it can actually be the pitfall of the whole scenario. Now, a few years ago, I was decluttering my closet. This method works really well if you have your final goal in mind. Like if you can be like, no, my goal is to keep my closet tidy, I want to declutter it, I don't want extra stuff in there. I think that's absolutely great. The problem with this method though is some people have a memory for absolutely everything and they feel like the slightest happy feeling is joy and that they should keep it all. So I had this hamster and he was like really cute, although I know he hated me, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, the day he died, it was a super sad day and I was wearing this clip in my hair 
I was 12. And to be honest, I just like to keep this because it reminds me of my hamster, even if it's not really a happy memory, you know, the day he died. It will kind of be like saying this turmeric. Mm. I remember that time that I made a recipe with turmeric. It wasn't that great of a recipe, but I did have fun with my husband that day. I mean, he was my boyfriend then. So, hmm, I should keep it because this sparks joy, even though it did expire in 2017. Now, it certainly is a very useful method. So, Con Marie gets number four. The 10, 10, 10 method. Now this method involves choosing 10 items to keep, 10 to donate and 10 to throw away with each decluttering session. I just want to add that there are a lot of different kinds of 10, 10, 10 methods. Now the idea is to encourage you to make quick decisions about what to keep, what to let go of. It can also help you focus on what is really important to you. I love the ambition of this method. I think it's great. And I love that you can move through it really quickly once you have those decluttering muscles strong and you know exactly how you want to declutter. You were like, okay, I'm gonna like get rid of all this extra stuff. I don't want it sticking around. The problem with this method I see is that there's a lot of pressure a lot of people will probably feel when they do finally start decluttering. And they might feel completely overwhelmed and they don't know what category they want to put something in. And they're like, gosh, like, should I keep this? Should it be recycling? Should I donate it? I could throw this away. It's very old, but it's a waste to waste this container. But should I donate it? I don't know. It's so hard to decide. <sighs> well, this is overwhelming. I'm going to give the 10, 10, 10 a number three. Swedish death cleaning, also known as dostadning. Don't check my pronunciation of speaking Swedish, but this is a really great decluttering method, I think, and it has gained huge popularity in recent years. The reason behind it is to declutter and organize your possessions in theory so that your loved ones won't have to deal with the burden of sorting through your belongings after you have passed away. And this is actually, my my brother and I went through this not long ago because my dad died uh, about a year ago and we had to deal with his things. And you know, I don't, I don't begrudge him at all. The thing is, Swedish death cleaning can be a bit of a difficult process. We have to face our own mortality, which is never fun. I mean, really. No one wants to get old. No one wants to die, but we do. But many people actually find it super liberating and empowering. And it allows them to feel like they're actually like taking control of their possessions and that they can prioritize what truly matters in life. One other thing I absolutely love about it is it is a method that emphasizes the importance of decluttering and simplifying your life, not only for yourself, but for your loved ones. I am going to collect all the spices in the world. I can just store them in my pantry and they can stay forever. It doesn't really matter. It won't be my problem when I'm gone. But the other piece is actually enjoying life while we are living it, which is pretty much my motto here all the time. Your environment matters. Don't waste your life, all of that. So instead of saying, I'm just going to keep them all, I could say, well, decluttering and then tidying a lot of these, especially the empty ones and the things I don't use probably would be good no matter how much time I have on this earth because I'm going to be gardening in my 90s. And in all honesty, you are doing your loved ones a favor too. Although this clip I thought was hilarious. The premise behind Swedish death cleaning is you're supposed to get rid of all your clutter before you die so that you don't burden your loved ones with all your stuff, right? Well, I'm not doing it. I have cleaned up after these people way too long. Since we're getting to the heart of the matter, Swedish death cleaning gets number two, the 30 day challenge. Now this method, you might be able to tell, is one of my favorites, if not my favorite. It involves decluttering one item the first day, two items the second day, three on the third day, and so on and so forth. Hmm, day one, I'm gonna start with the Chinese five spice. I never liked that one. Day two, let's go for this empty container and this other empty container. Day three, okay, so here's some cardamom. I enjoy the cookies I made with it. It's expired though. And 
I also don't like this garlic salt. What I like about it is it's a gradual approach and it can make decluttering feel way more manageable. And I really like this method, especially for people who are new to decluttering. I actually did it about three years ago and I just walked around and made a bunch of piles, I got a bunch of boxes, had it all ready to go. It was so great. And let's be honest, turmeric, I don't like it. So it's a really great starter method for anybody first starting out, anybody who has done it for a while, but is just finding themselves getting super overwhelmed and stressed out. Because of its ease and sensibility, I am giving the 30 day method number one. All of these methods are so good, but I think the best thing you could do is to use all of them and maybe just at different times. So maybe when you're first starting, you'll do the 30 day challenge just to get on a roll. And then maybe you will do the 10, 10, 10 method because you still have a ton of stuff to declutter and you can actually work on that until you get a little bit burnt out from it. Then maybe do the Swedish death cleaning method because you're starting to get an idea of like, hey, I don't wanna leave this for other people, but at the same time, I wanna live with a bunch of great things around me. Once you get to the sentimental things, Marie Kondo's Con Marie would be so perfect. And when you're doing a maintenance declutter, the one room a week method would be so great. Now, maybe you think you should start decluttering in the garage or your closet, or maybe you're like, I don't even know where to start. And that is really holding me back from getting decluttering anyway. Check out this. Okay, I get it. The kitchen, it can be complicated, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, Here's the thing. If you start decluttering in the wrong spot, you risk overwhelming yourself and then completely derailing yourself. This is very important. Grab your tea and let's go. A lot of people want to start in their garage or their closet or a storage room. No, this is a bad idea. Beyond the terrible clothes you might find from the 80s or the scary mouse traps you might step on or that old curling trophy from your work party back in the early 2000s, it would be like deciding to climb a mountain on the steep side just to get it out of the way. I mean, I get it. You're motivated. But since you're just starting out, you're probably going to fall. Just like when you're trying to start in a space like your closet or your garage. Sure, you can find a few boxes to declutter or things and you'll maybe have a bit of success the first day, but you are definitely going to run into a lot of common roadblocks. Overwhelm is one of the biggest roadblocks for most people. And the thing about the garage and your closet and storage rooms is the volume in there quite often is huge and can completely derail us. And if we end up derailed because we are overwhelmed, it's really hard to get back to it. You haven't built up your decision muscles yet, which is another big roadblock. Yes, even if you have decluttered sometimes, it's still really hard to jump in at a place like the garage unless you really are good at making those, those tough decisions and you can be like, yes, I'm going to let this go. Doom boxes are another thing that are notorious in storage rooms and garages. These are boxes or bins or baskets or bags that just have a bunch of random assortment of things in there. And it is just so different. The categories are so different. It makes it very challenging for our poor brain to decide. So these are things that I beg of you, leave until later when you can be much quicker at tackling that. Plus the garage and storage rooms are where the just in case items live. And if you are wondering what the heck those are, those are things where we're thinking, well, I could use this one day. What if this happens? What if that happens? I mean, unless this is something that is for sure going to save your life, if for, for example, there's an earthquake or something, like we do wanna be prepared for emergencies, but if you're just hanging on to some fabric or some craft stuff just on the off chance that you're going to feel like starting to paint again, I'm gonna to suggest to you, this is probably not the case. In fact, for myself, when I decluttered my whole house, a few years ago, only once have I ever thought, hmm, oh yes, I did declutter that. But you know what you can do instead? You can either borrow it from somebody if you need to, and believe me, this is a rare case, so no, you're not going to be knocking on your neighbor's door all of the time. Or you can just go without, which is what I did. Another important thing to remember, sentimental items should be saved until way, way, way late in the game. There is just way too much decision and emotion involved to start there. Now, a quick note on the kitchen. Now, some people, they feel that the same amount of overwhelm as they do in their garage or their closet because there's a lot of stuff in the kitchen. If you've ever moved, you know that the kitchen holds a shocking amount of things. And with all of those things comes a decision. 
There could also be a lot of potential I could use it one day items. I mean, if you have an ice cream maker you've never used or some other random thing, you know what I'm talking about. However, there is the odd person, the odd, rare, mystical, mythical person who can actually thrive when decluttering the kitchen because there are less doom boxes and drawers and they just sort of have a clearer idea of what they want on average. But if you're one of those people who has every cupboard and drawer absolutely jam-packed, I don't recommend it. I've also worked with people who are completely motivated to start in their kitchen and they've had major success. There are two things to consider when you are deciding where to start. The first is a quick win and the second is satisfaction. First thing, I think you need to start in a spot that is going to give you a quick win. I often recommend a junk drawer or a utility drawer, whatever you want to call it. Maybe your laundry room, your dining room, your washroom. The whole point is that you can get it done hopefully the first day that you try and hopefully in about 30 minutes. You know yourself, you know your energy, you know your pace. I just know that for me when I first started decluttering 30 minutes seemed to work best and from most people I talk to at, from my channel or clients I've worked with, they say the same thing. Now I know some people really struggle with decision making so have grace with yourself. For satisfaction, remember how I said I like the junk drawer? Well, here's the thing. I open my junk drawer quite a lot. I prefer for me and for others to choose a space that you either walk through often or you open a lot so you can admire your work. This is very, very important. Again, the kitchen can be great for this reason, but if it's very cluttered, it might be overwhelming. So proceed with caution. As you work through the easier spaces, you're getting more and more skills and you are making more and more gains, just like when you're climbing the mountain. Hobbies, crafts, basements can be such a huge struggle. Now let me show you my process in action so you can see how I declutter. Maybe you have a very messy crafting area or another hobby area that is super cluttered. I get this question all the time from people and I can relate because my hobby area happens to be all about canning. And right now it's about to be exploding down here and it got super messy. Stay tuned, I'm gonna give you some awesome tips and tricks for how to declutter and organize your hobby area, your crafting area. But first I need to get my area clean Grab your tea, let's get started. Everything should start with tea. And as an ADHDer, I need my podcast to be entertained. Let's get to it. Before I jump into the tips, which are, I'm actually going to use a lot of these principles here. I'm gonna show you me tidying up my hobby area. Now I'm not really into crafts at the moment, although I have been. Right now I'm really into preserving and gardening and canning. So this area has gotten kind of messy. I actually moved this bookshelf from our furnace room and replaced a different one, which was shorter. And I will show you that in a minute because I use that area for starting my seed starts. And here are some small little jars. Those ones will probably get used last. Now this is a roaster and a Canadian tire bucket, of course. And I'm gonna stick that roaster under here. I don't like having things on the floor. I like to just have furniture pretty much on the floor and everything else should be in a place. When I am decluttering, I usually have three bins, one for bringing things home, one for garbage, one for recycling. I'm kind of using this for all of that because I'm really just tidying things up. And here I am just shuffling things around and now going to get to the fun part, which is putting things up on my shelves. And I am just so happy. Those pickles there on that shelf, they were up in the kitchen for a while because I just could not justify bringing them down until I could tidy up this area. And it just feels so good to get those things on there. And the other shelf you, you saw had a lot of other things on it too. And I'm just moving things around. It just feels so good. This is the thing about decluttering that is wonderful. When you declutter, you have space 
for things to all have a home, which is ultimately one of my major goals. I'm saving all of these boxes for the jars because they are starting to fill up. Now this Lego bin I just tucked under there and you can see some of our food stores because we are in an earthquake zone and I am dancing because I always celebrate. Now this area is the furnace room and you can see those lights there. Those are my grow lights and a couple other things. So first I decided to pull some things out of there because clearly they need to be organized. We also have an area under my stairs that needs to be cleaned. And this whole section of the basement is getting tidied up because my son is moving and it's going to be a bit of a theme on my channel in the next few weeks. You know what's fun? When you find like an old, old router box and you know that this is not useful at all anymore and you think, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and bring this to a, an electronic recycler. Now I am on Vancouver Island in Canada, which is arguably the mildest, maybe it's not arguably the mildest area, but I really like to get a head start on my plants in the spring and sometimes in the fall. So I have these, they're just actually plain LED lights and I got them at Home Depot, but I am putting them back on the shelf. And you could see I was changing my podcast because Lord knows I need to be entertained. I'm really enjoying this new one called Tooth and Claw, which is all about like animal attacks, but like bear attacks because I have bears in my backyard and I want to know how to manage them. And uh, just as a little aside, he really recommends bear spray. But anyway, I am putting these up and those little hooks are so scary because you can lose them inside the light and it takes a lot of time because you literally have to take the light apart to get the hooks out. Exactly what I didn't want to happen happened. I lost one of those little links and they are so strong to bend. Ugh. Good news, I found a little hook somewhere else that had not been in use, but I'm very happy now. The principles I did earlier was grouping like things together. And that is sort of something similar that I'm doing here is I like to have a designated area for one thing. And I will get into those tips in a minute, but this is an area where I will start my seedlings. And it's an area that needs to be in use for months and months. So we could put other things in here, but what's great about having a decluttered house is that we do have space to put things. Although we do also have a larger house. So I won't be saying, oh yeah, you know, like your tiny little apartment, you should have lots of open space. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if at all possible, have a designated area. Now this here is my heating mat and I'm gonna throw that on there too. If you had a smaller house or an apartment and maybe you wanted a similar setup or for something else that is kind of seasonal, Having a way to store other things is important if you want to keep things somewhat tidy. Oh my gosh, and it looks great. I love that the lights turned on, woohoo. All right, we can plant some seeds. Getting into some tips for you, but first look how good this looks now. So much tidier is just a thing of beauty. I literally dragged my husband down here and was like, behold the beauty of this. And he was like, oh yeah, that's great. And the shelf with the food looks great too. And of course there's really no better angle to take this at. So that actually was quicker than I expected, which is why it is so good to make sure that you don't have a ton of stuff, which brings me to the tips for organizing your crafting or your hobby supplies. So number one would be assess your inventory. So what all do you have to organize? With me, I realized it was really a matter of like switching between the, the you know stuff from the other room in this room and getting it tidied and I know I will definitely be shuffling things around for sure and probably putting things from that one shelf over here but I want you to look at your entire situation you have going on with your hobby supplies and get a real feel for what you have. The next thing is to decide what you want your end result to be. So quite often people say to me, oh, I have so many crafting supplies and there's just so much and blah, 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 blah. What is it you wanna see? Do you want to see no crafting supplies? Do you want to see perfectly organized and you know very neat? Or do you, are you okay with there being a lot? You just want to know how to declutter it. Which brings me to the third tip, which is to set 
goals. So what are the goals that you have when it comes to your decluttering? Do you want to get it super organized? Like I said, what is your end result in mind? And so your goal would be like today, I am going to declutter everything I don't want. And the next part would be, okay, I'm going to decide how I'm going to organize it. What kind of containers I'm going to use things like that. Am I going to keep it in this one part of the house or am I going to move it? So what are the goals? When do you want to have it done by? And then we get to the actual decluttering and organizing part. So what you're going to do is look at the crafting supplies that you have and decide if you actually use them. So for the polyfill, for example, we bought that for a craft that never actually happened. And I know we will not be using it. So I'm going to take that and donate it because somebody else can use that craft. And I think that quite often, a lot of us who craft or who have other hobbies, we buy things almost like um, with an idea of doing a craft and then we don't do that craft or it's almost like a periphery thing for, I don't know, it's just like a craft adjacent thing or something we're going to do. So really be honest with yourself. Are you using it and do you like it? Um, a lot of people have a lot of quilting, quilting supplies, so they have a lot of excess fabric. Are you going to use that? And maybe some of those fabrics you don't like. So get rid of anything you don't like, get rid of, get rid of anything you don't use. And of course, get rid of anything that is um, expired, like old paint that's all dried up, or anything that's damaged, things that just don't work well. Quite often people think, oh, I have this. If I just fixed it, then I could keep it. I don't, and, and if you're, if you haven't fixed it by now, are you going to fix it? And if you really do think you will, then I'd love for you to give yourself like a time limit and if you don't get it done, just say to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to get that done. And that's okay. It's okay to not get that thing done. And then I'd love for you to decide how you're going to store things. Now, I love storing things in um, glass jars, like for my candy things. I have a big thing coming up with my pantry soon. You're going to see all, both, most of my hobbies actually involve like gardening and cooking. So I'm kind of lucky there, but maybe you're going to use boxes that are like solid so you can't see through. So they look tidier. In that case, I really recommend labeling them clearly. Now, a lot of people or one of the things I really do hazard people against is just throwing a bunch of things in a container. And I have done videos before about how I feel about baskets. I don't think it's a great idea to just randomly throw things in baskets. I think that every basket should have one designated category ish. So like if you had one that was like a bunch of pencil crayons and you also also had pencils in there, you know, like, okay. But Ideally, you do have things separated within reason. I don't think you should be spending a bunch of money or any money if you don't want to, or just go to the dollar store, get something really cheap just to keep things organized and neat. And then of course, label them. Labeling is one of the very best things that you can do to keep things organized. And then of course, it's what is your workspace going to look like? Are you going to keep things tidy and put away? Some people, they don't have a designated spot in their house for their work area. Like it, it's part of their dining room, which is of course like totally fine, but you're probably going to want that area very tidy. And even if it is like it, as, as you have your whole room, that, you know, like this room of our house, our friend built this house for himself and we ended up buying it. But this used to be a room where he had like a train set up. It's a very unique room. And this whole room was just for that. So he could probably leave it kind of messy if he wanted to. I don't know if he did, but maybe you have like a sewing room or do you want everything left out? If you do, I totally understand that. Like maybe you want to leave things just so, but like for me at the end of the day with my office and my desk, I like to tidy things up and make sure that they are neat. Now you might be like, but decluttering takes forever. Now I have got you covered, Linda. These different tips will save you time and energy. Here is how to declutter your house five times faster and make sure you stick around. The last tip is amazing. Now there is a theory that states 20% of your belongings contribute to 80% of the clutter in your space. 
on the surface level, I think that is totally true because if I look around my house on a day when it is feeling really cluttered, it's kids' clothes, it's things I haven't put away, it's paperwork, it's recycling that hasn't made it to the bin. It is the usual suspects. Once we tackle this problem fast, because it's only 20% of the stuff, we can feel like our space is less cluttered and we can get to the deeper stuff more quickly too. It's like when I tell my teens to pick up their room. I say, start with the big stuff. Start with your clothes, start with the dishes, start with the garbage. There's a lot of big stuff that they leave lying around. If you're super focused, it is really, really fast. But one of the biggest problems with decluttering is that it can feel like a massive job. Oh, I'm just going to declutter my whole house. Ugh, that will take ages. If you're anything like me, your kitchen gets cleaned at least once per day, probably like six times a day if you're me. Well, imagine adding up all the time that it takes for you to clean your kitchen. That would be like 9 million minutes in a year, give or take. That's pretty overwhelming. And if you think about it, decluttering is the same thing. It's a process that takes time. And it's also a process that can be incorporated into your daily activities bit by bit. But the important part is the focus. Even if you only spend five minutes per day, that is a really, really long time. Believe me, because I am currently trying to revive my lawn, yet I'm trying to be very water conscious, so I can actually only water for five minutes at a time. Now I set the timer on my watch, and naturally I just end up going to find something to do while I wait. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I am amazed at how much I can get done during those five minutes. We humans are a lot like the genius animal, the crow, which by the way, was an excellent movie. I'm just gonna say. Now we have shiny object syndrome, meaning we get distracted easily. Whether it's thinking, I'll just check my email to Facebook to suddenly I just need to pet my cat. The problem with getting distracted is that research has shown it takes 23 minutes and 15 seconds to refocus on the task after being interrupted. Now, if you add all of this up, it can feel like we are decluttering or doing whatever it is forever. And this is why even five focus minutes can feel like an incredibly fast way to get your decluttering done. You probably know that old fable of the grasshopper that just sits around all summer while the ant is gathering food. Well, that ant has lots of food for the winter and the grasshopper completely starves to death. Now, if you procrastinate cleaning, you're probably not going to starve to death. I would hope you don't, but you are going to continue living in an environment that is not serving your mental or your physical health. So when you decide to declutter, commit and do it. One of my favorite ways to get off the couch when I am watching my favorite uh, YouTuber Max Miller is I use Mel Robbins 54321 method. You just count down from five, five, four, three, two, one, and then you get up. You just do it like you're a rocket ship. And don't get caught up in finding the perfect box, the perfect place to donate, or other perfect things. This is a classic procrastination technique and a lot of us don't realize it. It's almost like perfectionism. You just need to start. And make sure that you schedule the time to declutter in. A stitch in time saves nine. Now for me, I am completely lost without my schedule. I end up doing random things and completely forget what I actually want to get done. I just get thrown off. I love how when I schedule things out, they get done. Like today, I had a bunch of things on my list to do and I just kind of started them and in no time I was done. I also love the idea of anchoring one activity to one that we always do. So if you're trying to create a new habit like decluttering every day, maybe consider anchoring it to things like brushing your teeth or eating dinner. How about after you eat dinner, you declutter? Write that down and in no time, it will become a habit and you will have a totally decluttered house. Now, a lot of people, they really struggle with clothes and they don't know what to do if clothes, they don't quite fit or they used to fit or they never fit or they don't really like them, but they spent money on it. Here's how I decide what to keep and what should go. I think this is a no. What do you think? I was saving this, like, and I thought that this fit. It's pretty tight. Now, I actually get this question from people all the time. What do I do 
with clothes that don't actually fit now, but I hope will fit one day. As I try on my pile of clothes here, let's go through the criteria. And later on, we are going to get into a mind blowing tip about shoes. Yeah, I think this is a no. Why is it that you are trying to change your body? Now, I know a lot of people, they're talking about body positivity and you know what, if you are a certain size and you are happy being that size, if you are like, I recognize there are some risk factors. Remember, I'm a nurse, emergency nurse. I've been part of a lot of like cardiac arrests and things like that. People who have cardiac issues, blood flow issues. I get that you might be like, I actually wanna change that for that reason. Okay, that is perfectly valid. I'm not telling you what you should do. But if you're like, actually, like I'm pretty happy with my body. It's just that I want to fit those clothes. Is that a realistic thing to keep those clothes even though you're pretty happy with your body? And the other thing is to recognize that our body composition changes, things move around. Certain things move down, okay? Gravity is taking its toll on a lot of different body parts, okay? And so like, I have hips, I'm a curvy hippie lady. So one of the things I have been doing is working out lately. And the main reason for this is actually because my grandpa has dementia. As a nurse, I've worked with a ton of people with dementia and I know it's something that I would like to postpone as long as possible. So I work out um, probably about five or six days a week right now. And I have actually been shedding a few inches, which is certainly nice, but also a reason why I am actually going to keep some of the clothes that I'm very close to fitting into, but ones that I know I will like when I do fit into them better. I'm still subject to things changing as I get older. Maybe when you do fit it, if you are trying to change it, then you wouldn't actually like how it fits in the first place. And I am wearing the spandex, which makes it easier to pull things down. Just doesn't necessarily make it easier to like comfortably like stand or sit or like walk, okay? And this is like pinching me as I try to do it up. I think this is a no. What do you think? This dress I wore to my brother's wedding. I was nursing my child who is now 15, so. I've had it for a while. Now, the next question, ask yourself, are you working to change your body composition? And there's nothing wrong if you're not. If you are going for walks every day and if you're like committed and you're like eating differently and you're wanting, you need to want to make those changes, then you need to go ahead and maybe save those goals if you want to. If you don't, declutter them. If you're not trying to make that change and that's perfectly fine, don't worry about it. And the next part of that question is how long have you been trying? If you've been trying for a few years, I would invite you to reevaluate what you're doing if you truly are wanting to change your size, which is totally up to you. But if you're like, you know what, I've been trying for 10 years to fit into these clothes, it could be that like we talked about body composition changes, it might not happen. The other question to ask yourself is like, how many sizes difference is it? Is it like multiple sizes? Because if it is, you might just want to be like, eh. Remember, you might actually not want to wear those clothes in the long run, like I said. Some styles change. Some things are not gonna fit this too tight. Oh my gosh. Oh. Are you holding on to it? as a sentimental impulse. Are you saving something because you remember wearing it somewhere and you're like, it was so great. Or you remember like a certain time, maybe it's from when your kids were little and you really appreciate it. I had to put this one on just because it's a win. <laughs> it's stretchy. And I think this could fit me many, many sizes, which is good. But remember, when we're holding on to things for sentimental reasons, if they don't fit us and we just have them in the closet, hoping that they're going to fit us one day, that is going to definitely impact you in the long run. It's going to add to clutter. It's going to stress you out. You're going to look at it and it will probably make you feel bad if you are wishing you were a different size. So I suggest decluttering things that you're holding on to sentimental reasons, especially if all of the other questions I ask don't pass, for example, okay? Okay, let's get to the shoes part. The frizz is so bad. It's so bad. It doesn't just fit for dresses. Let me tell you, these shorts. Oh my gosh. Oh. And yeah, I'm putting them on over other shorts. Believe it or not, that's actually probably helping. I can't do these up. 
I cannot. I mean, if I put this on, the button would probably pop. Ah, oh, here's the thing. This is what I wear most of the time. So I probably don't need all of those dresses anyway. I probably need only a few, and it's probably going to be the two that are actually stretchy and forgiving. I like that kind. Okay, this one is actually big, um, which is okay, but the, I, 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 this never fit me. I bought it, um, I think at like the end of summer, and then didn't even try it on until the next spring, and it is just big, and it just does not fit my stature. If I was a tall, lean, gorgeous European woman, this would look great. The problem is I am five foot one and I feel like I look like a kindergartner and it's really big. First of all, I didn't know I had this, but I was like, I paid money for this and it never ever wore it. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna let it sit in my closet. No, this is going to be decluttered. And, and yes, like I guess it does fit me, but it doesn't really fit me, right? Right. When I first started working as a wound care nurse, one of the nurses who I was working with said, make sure you ask people what their shoe size is. If it is the same as when they were 20 or when they were in their teens. Interesting story because I used to be a six and a half, maybe a seven when I was in my teens and my 20s. As we get older, the bones in our feet spread out. So even after a couple of pregnancies, my feet had grown. So now at the age of 43, I'm now a size eight. So when you are going through your shoes, I invite you to really take a thought and say, are these actually fitting me? Are these too tight? Because a lot of people, especially as people, we get older, we get a lot of rubbing in our toes and other spots of our feet, and we can actually develop some wounds that can be pretty hard to heal. So if you are still wearing the same shoe size as you did when you were young, whether or not you've had pregnancies, maybe reevaluate if you might need to move up a size. At the very least, it's a nice excuse to get some new shoes and let those other ones go, right? Now I've got another boost for you. It is 70 plus decluttering tips to give you some great ideas for what you can do today and now you don't need to do them all. Declutter any shoes that are too old and don't fit. Set a goal for the amount of items that you want to declutter. It's always nice to have goals. Have a designated spot for things like your keys or your mail so you are never looking for them. Well, one could hope, unless you have ADHD. <laughs> Start by identifying the things that are the most important to you. Focus on keeping only those things that matter or things that you use. Take before photos. You will thank yourself in the end. Get a label maker and use it to label all of the things that you have organized. Really, what's sexier than a label maker? Nothing. Use a dish rack to keep dishes from cluttering up the sink. Load your dishwasher as soon as you can. This helps you keep your kitchen clean and without a bunch of stuff sitting around making it look cluttered all the time. And empty it ASAP as well so that you can load it right away. Create a maybe pile or box for items that you're not quite sure about and then go back to it later to decide if you actually want to declutter them. And you probably should. Use hooks to hang and organize things. Use clear storage containers to keep items visible, easy to find, but also tidier. Try the KonMari method and only use things that you love and that bring you joy. Memories. Donate items that are in good condition instead of throwing them away. But don't donate items that are in poor condition. Throw them away. And recycle if at all possible. Keep your reusable bags organized. And make sure you wash them every now and then. Keep items that you use all of the time in an easy to reach location. As a short person, I consider this a public service announcement. Use baskets sparingly and carefully. These can very easily become a clutter catcher where things go to die. Use a makeup organizer to keep your makeup from getting lost in your drawer. Go through your old makeup and make sure none of it's out of date. Ooh. You know it's written on the back, right? Right where it says 12 months. 
Use vertical storage to maximize space and keep things off the floor. Use under bed storage for things that you don't use very often, like Christmas wrapping paper. Use a caddy to organize your cleaning supplies. Use a closet organizer to maximize space in your closets. Only keep the clothes that you wear. And turn the hanger backwards to see if you wear it within the next year, month, or season. Keep a donation box in your garage or in your spare room so that you have a spot to put things and then make sure that you donate it on a frequent basis. Use a storage bench to keep items off of the floor and tucked away. Use a spice rack to keep your spices organized. Organize your jewelry. Use a tool organizer to keep your tools from getting lost in the drawer or the garage. I'm speaking wishfully here. Use a towel rack to keep your towels neat and organized. Use a hamper. Bonus points for a sorting hamper to organize your laundry. Organize your pans from large to small. I can't believe I have to tell some of you this. Use a minimalist color scheme in your home if you want to create a cohesive and calming environment. Storage shelves are very handy, just only keep the things that you need. Use the one in, one out rule. Every time you buy something new, find something to declutter. Organize your cutting boards standing on their sides. Here's a life tip. Keep a minimalist mindset when it comes to agreeing to do things. Remember, less is more. Jomo, not FOMO. Ask for help when you're decluttering. You probably didn't get in this mess by yourself. And if you did, ask for help anyway. Keep a running list of things you need to buy and stick to it when you go shopping. And don't go shopping hungry. Mm -mm. No. Really do some deep exploring with yourself that if you have a need to constantly acquire new things and learn to be content with what you truly have. Use these 3M things to organize brooms and mop handles. Cubbies can be helpful to organize family and kid things, but be careful, things can get lost in there. And get rid of anything you haven't used in the last year or in the season that it's designated for, like an ice cream maker or a popsicle maker. I'm getting rid of one of those. Be minimalist mindset when it comes to gift giving and receiving. I like to give food and experience gifts when at all possible. Prioritize functionality over aesthetics when you're deciding what to keep in your home. If it's too much, much to look at, it's too much to look at. Declutter any duplicates. How many spatulas do you need? Get rid of anything that is not bringing you joy or serving an actual purpose. Use a minimalist approach to social media and limit the amount of time you spend on it. You can do this through some of the iPhone settings and many apps to download to help you keep yourself under control. It's not easy. Use digital storage instead of physical storage for items such as documents and photos. I am a huge fan of scanning and you can do it on your phone. Only keep things that you really truly use. Use multi-purpose items that save space and don't keep or buy unitaskers. Practice mindfulness and be present in the moment instead of seeking material possessions to entertain yourself and to get that dopamine hit. Keep your most commonly used utensils in an accessible spot and keep your lesser used ones in a different spot if you have room. Learn to let go of sentimental items that are no longer serving a purpose and might even make you feel bad. Practice self-discipline and resist the urge to impulse buy. Store your storage containers with the lids on so you don't lose the lids. Use a minimalist approach to home organization and simplify your storage solutions. Simplify your daily routine and focus on the essentials and then just do the non-essentials later. Also, don't over schedule yourself. Learn to live with less and appreciate the things that you truly have. Life is not about things. Only keep the cookbooks that you use. And anytime you get a new one, consider the one in one out method there. Practice gratitude and appreciate what you have instead of always wanting to acquire more. Get rid of the just in case things. Those are things that you're keeping just in case. And guess what? You almost never use them. And always, I mean always celebrate your wins. For me, it will always be with tea. <laughs> Try to keep a minimalist approach to entertainment and focus on quality over quantity. We love to take the kids to mini golf. And remember, minimalism is a journey and not a destination, and it takes time to develop a minimalist mindset. Check out this video here all about how to start decluttering. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!